one of the things that came up was um, students sometimes get very enthusiastic at the beginning of the course and then by the time they finish the course, they are not sure anymore that they want to be an entrepreneur because they get to hear uh, things like failure rate is very high and you have to be very persistent and you know there is a lot of messages we do not even know as educators that we are conveying to them. So, even though they are very enthusiastic, see on the one hand you do not want them to feel ha 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 you know you have to become an entrepreneur, but at the same time you also do not want them to come to the wrong conclusions that entrepreneurship is so difficult that only some people can do it or sometimes we even do we even teach them about personality traits things like that right. So, I made a note of it I want to think about all the objections uh, that people actually learn through our courses uh, and I want to touch, touch upon some of them. So, we already talked about I do not have an idea you can already see right in effectuation you do not have to have a brilliant idea in fact you do not have to have an idea at all you just need to have something that looks like something you can do right. Uh, I do not have money you do not have to have money, you just have to calculate your affordable loss. I always tell my students if poor illiterate women in Bangladesh can build successful companies, you can build a successful company if you want <laughs> right. Uh, then we I am afraid to fail and there are a lot of techniques uh, in effectuation, but also from real world entrepreneurs you think about the relationship between failure and success and I tell people there are only three rules right. Uh, first of all in life as in entrepreneurship failures is what you have to think about not just one failure and the rule I uh, will tell them is keep them small kill them young do not fail alone that is the crazy quilt and the uh, pilot and the plane. <coughs> so, so I have actually going to take this as an assignment I am going to think about all the different things that come up when we teach and then I want to give the counterpoints. So, for example, I teach my students things like a third of all successful entrepreneurs actually do not even leave their full time job when they start their company. Third of all entrepreneurs are hybrid entrepreneurs there is very good evidence for it there is an article in management science uh, that looks at these numbers. So, if you say you know oh if you you do not want your students leaving the course thinking that entrepreneurship is all or nothing right I have to either throw myself in or I cannot do it at all that is not true. In fact, I say uh, entrepreneurship is ultimate backup op option right anything goes wrong anywhere in life if you know how to start a company it will feed you <laughs> right. Uh, but it's, it should also be a live option throughout your life and what I mean by that is even if you choose not to become an entrepreneur there are many many ways you can become part of entrepreneurship. For example, you can set aside some time every year maybe nights and weekends and go spend some time work with uh, local companies. You can put together partnerships for example, if you are working for a large corporation uh, maybe you are a technical person and you can find your local uh, I do not know Sabudana Vada shop and you think this ought to be a franchise and I can build a website for you right. So, maybe you are a marketing person there, there are many different ways you can engage in entrepreneurship that way what you have done is down the road if something say very good happens in your life and you know you do not need a job you can go join this uh, young entrepreneur or uh, maybe a, a very active entrepreneur not young, but not very well educated maybe or the, all those kinds of you can be a social entrepreneur you can start an NGO things like that or maybe something bad happens and you lose your job or something and then you have this option because you have been working with entrepreneurs you can start your own, but you will also join a company that is beginning to take off right. So, this is what I mean by a backup option and a live option I talked to them about that. I also talk to my students about uh, when they come to class I tell them bring some other people right bring your <coughs> significant other your spouse your parents your siblings because when you try to do this alone it seems really difficult right. But if you have the support system and I will give you one spectacular example in my class I had this brilliant student uh, he was a Korean born uh, and raised in Japan and he knew all his life that the Japanese people kind of discriminate against non Japanese people. And his idea was to start an apartment complex in Tokyo that would be non discriminatory right to, uh, to non Japanese people he was very passionate about it he was brilliant he was like a topper in uh, our school. So, of course, he was getting obscene job offers from all the big companies right. So, he comes to my office and he says Saras 
this is what I really, really want to do. But if I don't take the job, my wife will kill me. And I don't mean that figuratively. She will actually kill me. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I still remember that. And he was serious. He was very distressed. So I, I didn't know at that time what to do. What do you tell him? So I said, why don't you ask her to come to class also? And then she attended. So I was teaching this class called Starting New Ventures. So she also came to class. And as part of Starting New Ventures, I also do dinners in the evening so that we can have small group discussions of the ventures and stuff like that. She attended the whole thing. At the, can you guess what happened at the end? Yeah, Pardon? She started the venture. She made him take the job. <laughs> she started the venture. <laughs> <laughs> they did very well. They sold the company. Now the both of them are in Australia. They still keep in touch with me. <clears throat> right? That's when I realized that that's where you know, talking about a, it takes a village, uh, it really does the way to build. People always talk about ecosystem. They're always paying me to come and tell them how to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I always say, well, start teaching in first grade. <laughs> right? <laughs> so what I mean by that is, so imagine in the 17th century when uh, Francis Bacon wrote Novum Organum, right? The idea of a scientific method. The idea that you don't need divine revelation to get knowledge, that there is a systematic way we can all understand the universe, right? Uh, imagine if we had taken that and taught it only to future scientists, right? The 19th century and the 20th century would never have happened. There will be no technology, there will be no democracy. I mean, like all the reason and scientific thinking that has powered us through uh, the 19th and 20th century would never have happened if we took that attitude. So I call effectuation like as a part of the entrepreneurial method. And this is a method that can be used to solve problems in a variety of human domains, not only in starting a venture. It, we learn from people who, are, who have started ventures, but it can actually be applied in many parts. And so the idea is we should be teaching it to everybody. That's how you build an ecosystem. You know, your, uh, your uh, hairstyle uh, person should understand how to create an atmosphere so I meet somebody during the hassle and we are able to make a deal. That's what happens in Silicon Valley. Nobody taught them. It's just sheer quantity of things happening that place has become like that. But if you want to, it's not all about just simply putting like biotech incubators, right? That's not the way to build an ecosystem. The way to build it is everybody, you know, you have to demystify that, uh, that just like we demystify, even uh, people who have never been to uh, school sometimes will love learn from their children how to think about science. So I had this thing. So my uh, my auntie and my uh, mom and all will say, you know, if you put salt in the dal, it will not cook fast. So I still remember I was like seventh, eighth grade something, and I had just learned about the experiment. And I said, let's actually do that. One part of dal with salt, one part without salt, and let's see is it actually true. And they were all mad at me because they are convinced that the one with the salt is not going to cook it will be wasted. And they are like, no, we are not going to waste that. Right? And I had to convince them and then we went, went through the thing and we figured out that in actual fact it didn't take any difference in time. It is just that the one with the salt, uh, the texture was a little different. It was a little bit more chewy. In fact, it is very tasty by itself, but it doesn't become mushy the way it becomes when you cook it without salt. Time may kuch farak nahi bada. Right? And so you can, you know, if a fifth grade, sixth grade person can learn and uh, not just learn the scientific method, but teach it to people, why can't we do that with entrepreneurship? And then some of those people will start companies. But let me tell you, all of those people know how to support an entrepreneur. Right? If you become a banker, if you become a, if you're an artist, you will know how to work with an entrepreneur. You will know things like how to structure an equity relationship. And that's what we should be fighting for in the longer run. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that I'm saying to overcome, uh, and then I'll tell you one more, uh, which is one of the biggest reasons a lot of people go wrong. It is the biggest and most, you know, um, what I think about is the worst myth out there, and that is that failure rate is very high, <coughs> right? Let me tell you, failure rate is not what you think. The, we have very good studies now in the last 10, 15 years. For a long time, we didn't have good studies. Now, there are multiple studies, uh, and I actually summarized these studies recently in a book chapter that I'll send you also. So, I'm going to give you in a nutshell, right? So, most people think 9 out of 10 companies fail. That number comes from venture capital. Because in, when you're funded by a venture capitalist, it is true. 
because their strategy is high risk high return right they are only putting in companies which they think will do very very well so their strategy is high risk high return but here is a, here are some of the numbers you need to know in the us which has the largest venture capital industry there are about 500000 employer firms that get started every year less than a thousand will get vc money this is the largest vc industry right so when you look at that that makes no sense yeah sure 9 out of 10 vc so you have to look at the other 500000 what happened and when you go and look at that here's what you find half of those companies i'm talking about all the companies in the country half of them are around 5 years later 8 uh, years later and of the half that are not around a third were profitable at the time they closed down so they didn't close down because they were not making any money right they closed down for some other reason usually because it is people who retire and their children don't want to run the company stuff like that right so it's a profitable venture uh, that closes down and then you find one out of 10 right is actually goes bankrupt which means owes money to creditors so really when you look at the failure rate is the reverse 9 out of 10 actually do well so total 10 fire still around at the um, uh, end of 8 years two of them closed down while they were profitable one of them went bankrupt that leaves still two and then you go and look at what is the reason for failure of these two it turns out almost all of them are actually partnership failures nothing to do with the market nothing to do with the money is the co-founders couldn't get along or they went into a partnership with somebody else and that person like defrauded them or something right so when you actually look at it this idea that entrepreneurship is terribly risky sure it is risky in the sense that you don't get a steady income from day one and that is why we teach affordable <coughs> loss right so you don't leave the don't necessarily have to leave the job before you start the company so i'm going to give you an and now that uh, you've raised this issue i'm actually going to write a technical note like a note that you can give to students with slides uh, i'll uh, create that within the next month or so uh, i'll put it up on effectuation.org but i'll also send it out to you guys because i think it'll be useful you can give it out to students and actually have a discussion on risk and failure but also you know the uh, let's get rid of the idea that it's an all or nothing phenomenon that many many ways of getting engaged in entrepreneurship okay yes i have a friend who has set up his startup in gujarat yeah Mm-hmm. Now, within like they were cash rich and so on, they turned the cash profit. They were doing very well. Yeah. So one fine evening, he just called me up and he said, "I'm just shutting down the business." Yeah. So I said, "Why? What happened? What's wrong with you?" Yeah. So he just ended up telling me, "In the days, VC is just eat your brains out. Correct. They don't let you work. Yeah. So he shut that down. Yeah." correct uh, exactly so uh, somewhere i don't know maybe the venture capitalists expect too much out of them <coughs> and they are in a hurry to make money yeah so they put a lot of pressure on them absolutely kind of is their creativity yeah absolutely and remember they uh, they are so small i mean they are very 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 few for, for, so as educators when we focus so much on vcs we are ignoring a lot of the actual businesses that our <laughs> students could be starting you are absolutely correct so i can give you more bad data or ba- not bad bad news uh, good data but good data which is bad news about uh, vcs so when you look at the most successful firms that go ipo in the us uh, less than a third of them are vc funded so there are two thirds of firms that are going ip ipo who are actually getting funding from other places so the question is do you think where are they getting the funding from and is the crazy cool principle customers suppliers sometimes employees sometimes competitors uh, so these are relationships so we are going to look at the crazy equal a little bit more uh, on that front and uh, the other thing you want to know is the day you sign a, a term sheet with a vc that is a 50% you are basically tossing a coin there's a 50% chance you will not be ceo the next year because one of the terms is they can d- decide to bring in somebody else to run the company so when you take all of those into account we really should ask ourselves why are we spending so much time on this vc 
uh, thing and getting people <laughs> off of that. It's great. Some company VCs are adding value in many, many ways. And like I said, less than 1,000, one hundredth of 1% 1 of companies get VC funding, but a third of IPOs get it. So, they are adding some value. I am not saying they are not ad uh, doing anything and we need them, but our we should be more careful and think about what are the different ways that entrepreneurs actually build ventures and that is where a lot of these things, uh, the research is very important. It takes time to do research and then to actually show, to publish and get that research validated by the academic community takes time. People just rush into things from media or something like that. So, uh, but, but we have the research now. So, yeah, yes. I have a question. Sure. Uh, I think uh, during the case of the discussion that in, in the class, you know, initially there are uh, almost 90 percent students willing to start their own and decide yeah. it. And towards the end, they just you know, yeah. die down. Yeah, that's one I want to fight for sure. Yeah. So yeah. Here, I mean, I have seen this in incubation centers. I yes. Think. So, they start, they have a team. Somewhere their aspiration die down or their persistency die down or they find some better opportunity or their patience die down. I don't know what happens, but at least in four to five incubation centers, I've observed that out of ten, at least five or six, they yeah. make it beyond two years. Yeah. There's a there's a good reason why. Because a lot of these people would not have started the venture if it were not for the incubator to some extent, right? <coughs> so, I always say that you, um, you want to find uh, um, uh, people who would start and run the company anyway with or without the incubator, right? If, if you are having to incentivize them and attract them <coughs> and things like that, you are going to attract the wrong kinds of people. That is why self-selection is very important uh, in effectuation. You do not go and select people and say you should become an entrepreneur uh, and then you have to provide them all kinds of incentives and you are going to, uh, that is not the way to do it. So, um, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, and plus we teach them the wrong thing in incubation, right? We teach them you come up, we teach them ideation, we teach them prototyping and then you are going to talk to customers. Whereas, if you look at how these people have built the company, day one, right, they have calculated burden hand and affordable loss, day two, they are selling a non-existent product in many cases without prototype, right? In some cases, prototype is easy to build. If you can build prototype for affordable loss, sure, build it. Right? But if not, you do not have to wait for the prototype in order to go sell. Day two, you start selling to people and the idea really is the skills that you need as an expert entrepreneur have nothing to do with product and nothing to do with just the what I call the toolbox, the marketing or the business planning or the what this really requires is to be able to bring people on board who want to work with you and they want to put their skin in the game and we are not talking investors, we are talking employees, we are talking distributors, we are talking designers, we are talking lawyers and accountants, we are talking customers, we are talking competitors who you want to work with and, and that is really the heart of what the lessons the expert entrepreneurs learn, but these are very difficult to teach, <laughs> that is the problem. Yes. Uh, my experience is the true entrepreneurs uh, generally have their strong sense of independence and autonomy. But these VCs and the mentors, these all, you know, in a way actually <coughs> provide too much of instructions. Correct. And they take away that, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> autonomy and in sense of autonomy and independence from them. I mean, they, they literally dictate, yeah. you know, this is what you need to do. Exactly. Uh, which is, you know, actually killing entrepreneurship. Correct, you know? correct. And they will give some random one example that they encountered and yeah, they say, exactly. this is why you should do it. Uh, uh, and and I gave you money so you better listen to me. Or else I know better than you, so you better listen to me. Yeah, G a great point. I'll actually show you. I do this with my students. Uh, so I'm just going to take what you said and put it in a in a framework, right? A lot of people will say do X, right? Whatever that may be, right? Uh, you have to have a great uh, name for the company. Whatever it may be, like do X, and then let's say you have don't do X. So you can have. Either you do or you don't do and then you have success and then you have failure. So, <clears throat> there will be somebody who has gone and looked at this and they found 50 instances that when somebody did X, there is success, right? And then they think, oh my God, I know the answer now to success and they will be saying, oh, it is all about persistence, persist, 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 right? Some such a thing. So, persistence can be X. This can be anything. Find any bestseller. 
So this is what I call the three dollar bestseller. Right? <laughs> then there will be somebody else who came and looked at it and they find this person did, a, anybody who did X and succeeded and people who didn't do X failed. Oh, now I really know what's going on. This is what I call the $30 bestseller. bestseller. <laughs> right? Here's our job as academics. We know there's probably 70 here and you know 65 here. This is how the world looks for the most part. So the question is how do we teach? How do we know what to teach? The key is not to have success and failure as our uh, touchstone. Okay? What we really need to do is a variety. So this should be not a thing like this. So like a variety of outcomes. So you will say if you did this, here are some doors that will open. And here are some doors that, so you are going to, uh, we are going to teach them all kinds of relationships here and all kinds of relationship here, right. But let us say this is negative, this is positive outcomes and the same way we are going to teach a whole bunch of things here and a whole bunch of things here. All four relationships we are going to understand deeper and we are going to teach them all of them and now you are building judgment, right. You are building, you are not just teaching people rules. You are not teaching them success factors or shortcuts. You are actually teaching them judgment. So they know. So the idea is not if you do X, you will succeed and so you do that. So uh, experienced entrepreneurs, when you bring them to class, you will, you will hear this. Persist, they will say. Of course, you got to be persistent. And then five, ten minutes later, they will say, of course, you need to know when to like uh, quit. <laughs> and they will say, like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> Over and over, let us say, you know, the best kind of leadership is we should be consensual, right? You should not be dictating people on what to do. And then another will say, but you got to be decisive, right? Any decision is better than like no decision, even a bad decision. So they will say, so I have collected actually 14 of these contradictory statements that uh, entrepreneurs routinely make. And the answer is they are actually correct, it is from that. They are telling, yeah, so, so affordable loss, for example. Suppose you say, I am I'm just going to use money as a proxy, it does not have to be money. Let us say, I am going to invest maximum 50,000 in my venture. When the 50,000 runs out, I am going to go back to my job or you know, do something else. Uh, what does it do, allow you to do? It is saying, so long as I have the 50,000 and I am using that up, I am going to be a pit bull, I am going to be persistent. But at the end, when the 50,000 ends, I am going to sit down and seriously consider quitting. See, now you know how to persist because once you have decided your affordable loss is 50,000, during that time you do not have to worry about it. You do not have to constantly think, oh, what if I lose, what if I lose, because you made that calculation already ahead of time. So, it is that is the kind of thing that we need to teach. There is a technique there on how to be persistent but also learn how to quit and when to quit. Uh, so, all of those things is what we want to be doing. So, any time anybody says you do this, you do that. So, the same thing with personality, right? Every kind of, we have actually shown, I, t I, I go into like big audiences with uh, entrepreneurs uh, sometimes and I will actually say, you give me the set of circumstances. So, so you can say like a woman who has never worked for a living, she has three kids and uh, she got divorced or became a widow whatever and now she has to start a company or somebody else will say 65 year old man you know whatever uh, who is very very shy and does not you know is very very systematic he has been an accountant all his life uh, can he and I will give you a story of a successful entrepreneur right. So there is no kind of combination of personality and life circumstances where people have not built a successful company and for the same set of personalities you can also give a lot of people who actually failed or it did not even get started. So, so again personality by itself is not the issue. The question is given who you are, given your personality, what kind of venture can you start and succeed at is different. So, uh, again I will give an example from my original study of the expert entrepreneurs. In my original, and this is a wonderful contrast, right. There was a guy who was actually rated top 10 best bosses to work for. 10 years in a row, Labour magazine had ranked. Um, and uh, I also had in the same sample, a guy who had been uh, ranked not for 10 years, but for 7 because the company uh, had not been noticed till the top 10 toughest bosses to work for, right. And here is my experience between these two companies, right. In the 
top 10 best bosses work for it's a midwestern company they are in an old style <coughs> manufacturing thing i come in there my appointment is at like 3 o'clock right i come in and the receptionist uh, in the building sort of looks like me right uh, and she said oh you must have where did you fly from my dear was your flight on, on time you must be a little bit tired would you like to have a cup of tea and then she walks me and then we go into the canteen and she's to showing me all kinds of things there's pictures there's music playing uh, she's going to be 15 minutes beyond the time I said I keep telling like my appointment you know she says ah no problem you know take your time you know to have your cup of tea and then we can go in and then I go and meet the CEO okay uh, and this is a company uh, that actually manufactures teddy bears a multi-billion dollar company <laughs> the other one I go this is actually in Silicon Valley my appointment is at 1 o'clock which in the US is immediately after lunch right uh, and I'm always at least 15 minutes early to my appointment, so I will get there at 12.45. There's nobody in the building. And I walk up to this uh, C-suite on the top floor, and the uh, CEO's assistant is waiting for me. And the best way I can describe her is <coughs> crisp, right? Uh, so she looks at the clock, she's very approving that I am uh, a few minutes early. So I asked her, like, where's everybody? And she says, uh, we don't take lunch in our company. Everybody's out jogging. Right? Uh, <laughs> I waited for you because I knew you were, you had the one o'clock appointment, so I'm the only one waiting. Everybody's gone jogging, but they'll be back. Just, be, just before one o'clock, everybody will be back. And I walk into the CEO's office, his entire back wall is decorated with lawsuits that people have filed on. <laughs> <laughs> the motto of that company is, we eat nails. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Both of them have built multi-billion dollar, uh, very successful company, but they're completely different companies. And that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. Why are they able to do it? Why is it no one clear set of personality? Because there are as many kinds of products and markets as there are people. You look around you, every single thing, entrepreneurship is not just what we call startup. It's not just like Uber and Paytm, right? Uh, Every single thing, let me tell you, there are people who are uh, eating and sending their children to school based on every product you can find, right? And entrepreneurship is everywhere. So that, that's why I tell my students, you don't have to change your personality <laughs> to become an entrepreneur, but you do have to become more self-aware. You have to know what kind of a person, who am I, and who else do I need? Right? So you don't have to have all the personality traits. You will work with other people. You're going to bring in partners with whom you're going to work. And then you say, given who we are and what we know and whom we know, what kinds of ventures can we start? And then I'll finish that by giving them this li little thing that both optimists and pessimists can be great inventors. The optimist invents the airplane, the pessimist invents the parachute. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so don't ask about how can I become the successful uh, entrepreneur or how can I build the successful company, there is no such thing. You always say, given who I am, what I know, whom I know, what kind of successful ventures can I build? And then I can teach you how to do that, <laughs> right? We okay. Yes, sure. So we have a very famous definition in entrepreneurship. Yes. Which says, it is pursuit of opportunities beyond the resources of <laughs> So, uh, in the background of bird in hand, yeah. so what are your comments on that? So, um, I'm forgetting, uh, I'm having a senior moment now. Uh, who's the guy who wrote that? The Harvard guy, I forgot the name. Do you remember? Stevenson. Ah, Stevenson. I've actually had a conversation with Stevenson, and Stevenson will say, You're going to put me out of business, aren't you? <laughs> 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 and I told him, uh, My aim is not to put you out of business because if you're out of business, then nobody will believe my theory. This way, I can say Stevenson said that, and he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I need you. <laughs> but I think what they meant to say uh, there was a little bit different. So I, I do say that when you actually look at how expert entrepreneurs do, they are not pursuing uh, opportunities without regard. In fact, they are really tied to their resources. It is just that remember day one and then day two, they are already expanding their resources. So the, the resources that you have or don't have don't limit you because the whole world is open to you. But to get to that world, you still have to work with who you are, what you know and whom you know, right? But they are only looking at 
in terms of the outcomes. So, if you look at uh, uh, Mustafa who built the ID batter company and you think how could this guy you know raised in like a little village in Kerala with no money to eat breakfast, how could he build like this thousand crore company? It looks like of course, he did it without regard to resources. But if we actually look at what he did, he is looking very carefully. He, he is going to college, getting these jobs, saving up money. Uh, he has got three other partners and they are all sitting down and asking what kind of venture can I start and then they are saying you know here are some criteria that we want to use, we want to do something we know, we do not want to be competing with MNCs uh, and we want to say how quickly can we break even and they come up with the idea that if you have if you can sell 2000 packets of this bear batter a day and that is the minimal plant, the minimum grinder you can buy. Uh, they literally calculate, then we can break even within the, within the first three months. And they immediately think how can I, so they literally go to shops and get pre-orders for 2000 packages a day. That is how they start, so right. But they are building, a, if you go and look at it now, it looks like you know they just pursued the opportunity without regard to resources within their control. So basically, you think mm. beyond every time. Yeah. They are you reach something again, you look Correct. So, you always put that is what I say you do what is with doable and worth and doing, you and then you push it because the upside you can push, the upside is actually something you create, right? Yeah. So, we do have a couple of entrepreneurs in our group, Harish and uh, Reshma as well. Okay. Uh, just kind of letting know that we could also have discussion on that. And uh, one of the other questions uh, that I have received is. Um, do you take yep. effectuation as a course as well and is yep. there something like you could share your learnings around those classes? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, <coughs> the first thing is entrepreneurs welcome, pitch in any time you want, uh, ask questions but also share your experiences. Tell me I have experienced this or this has happened or here is something I am facing and what do I do? Ask any time, but I will take the second one first because the this session I do want to get to teaching materials. So, uh, I personally teach two courses at Darden. The first one is called Effectual Entrepreneurship, uh, which everybody, I mean virtually all the students will take. And then I follow that up with starting new ventures, which much more people who are serious about actually starting. So, the first one everybody can take because it is much more about the lessons from uh, expert entrepreneurs. And I will share with you five different like exercises and teaching materials that we have actually developed. And many of these teaching materials I will tell you it is on effectuation.org and we usually when we create the teaching materials we have the actual exercise, but you, you we usually also write a teaching note on how you can actually use the exercise. So, shall I go there and go into some of those uh, <coughs> exercises and I can show you uh, some of them as well. So, one of the exercises, one of my favorite exercises and this one has a um, you know it has both the written up the exercise itself with the teaching note is there, but I also did a video of it where you can just simply show the video and, uh, and that is another way to uh, th think about this thing. So, this is what we call the three earns exercise. What we are trying to teach here is to try to teach especially if you are going to teach either executives or MBA students. Uh, because they have already been through all the other business courses where they teach you causal thinking, right. So, I am trying to get them to see that there is something missing in what they have learnt <coughs> so far, right, because everything they have learnt is about the predictive world. So, if you just talk about prediction and control like it is a little too abstract for students. So, what I do is this is Frank Knight <coughs> in 1921 wrote his dissertation where he said there are three kinds of uncertainty in the world. Okay? So, the first kind is what you call a known distribution, but an unknown draw. Okay? I am just going to tell you then I will describe the exercise. The, the second kind of un uncertainty is where you have an unknown distribution, unknown draw, right? things get much more difficult. And then he said there is true uncertainty, which is you cannot even not only is the distribution not known, it is unknowable, okay? no, no technique can teach you. <coughs> so, the first two to some extent we tackle in causal thinking, right? Uh, causal thinking works. The third one is what the entrepreneurs are operating in. So, to illustrate that I came up with the exercise and what we do is 
I actually have I prepare these three jars ahead of time. Uh, and the first jar is empty, the second two I have already put stuff in it. So, I am just going to uh, simulate the exercise here. So, I bring in I take out I uh, have the bag <coughs> behind here, I will take out the first box and then I also take two bags of chocolate dark and white, and you can choose whatever, but preferably something black and white, it, it need not even be chocolates. Uh, in my case I just bring dark chocolate and white chocolate okay? and I will tell my students count and put equal number. Right, put 20 dark and 20 white or 10 dark and 10 white and then here is the game, I am going to go around and I am going to say what do you like dark or white and then the person might say I like dark, yeah, so he likes dark chocolate. So, I will say the game is put your hand in and remember these are not transparent jars, so people cannot see, they know that there is equal amount. So, I will say if you draw if you draw it and if you get a dark chocolate, you will keep the dark chocolate you, know, you can put in your hand in again and whatever chocolate you get second you can keep that also. Okay. Then I will go to the next person if they say uh, he says he likes white puts his hands in and he gets a dark he gets nothing he puts it back he gets nothing. So, I keep doing that. So, very quickly and I ask what is this game about and people will get very quickly you know this is risk <coughs> and I will say how can you play this game. So, there will be people who are already calculating in their head, oh he already took a dark chocolate and then the second one he took was a white, so now it is equal again, then he played he did not get anything, he played he took another uh, he said dark he got, so now two dark chocolate and then his second one was also now three dark chocolates are gone, right. So, the, uh, the odds have changed, so there is only seven dark and ten white in it. So, the next person will say white because they know they are probably even whether they like dark or white, right, so they are calculating the probability, so you can show. So, you can even though you do not know there is risk right, every time you put in you do not know what you will get, you can take a calculated bet and one of the things that will happen is several people will have chocolates in their hands by the time you are finished. Okay. Then I will say okay, great you are correct this is about risk taking uh, and then I will go and get my second jar and then I will go around this one nobody is putting I have already put right. So, I will go around and say dark or white and she will say dark she puts her hand in and she will get something pink. Okay. So, I put it back, it is not dark, then I will go to the next person, he, he puts his hand in, he will get something green, it is not dark, put it back and say uh, and then she will say white and then she will put that in and she will get purple. So, okay, that is not white, put it back, nobody is getting any chocolate, right? people are getting frustrated and I will go and ask the next person, now he is a smart guy, he has seen that they are not getting plus he has seen, so, so now he will just simply say red right they, they will start because they want to win right uh, and I will say sure now, even though I, he has changed the rule of the game, but I will say okay, red he will put in chances that he will not get red because there are multiple colors now and he does not know whether there is any red at all here the unknown distribution unknown draw much more difficult for anybody to actually get win a chocolate. You can still do the calculation, if I give enough time and then I come back and put it and say what kind of game is this and they will say uh, this is more difficult and so how, how can you play this game uh, and sometimes they will say oh you have to test it, you have to like you have to go. The idea is that if you do enough tests, if you eventually you can create a mental model of how many greens did you see how many and nobody ever saw a red. So, maybe red does not exist, but purple maybe pink blue exists. Uh, so, you can create a mental model, so that you kind of create you are estimating what the distribution is uh, and then you get the thing. So, it is much more difficult to play, difficult to calculate, but so I will tell them this is what uncertainty is. Then I will say, so uh, the risk daba is here, the uncertainty daba is here. Then I ask them, uh, if you could choose which game to play, which one would you play? What do you think the answer would be? Game 1 or game 2? Game 1, right? Because people will say, makes sense that at least everybody got chocolate, I mean half the people got chocolates. Uh, so, I will say, okay, this your it is true, you people have done big studies of this, Ellsberg did an experiment and people do preferably, people are rational. So, I will say, but if you ask an entrepreneur which game they would like to play, what do you think? Now, people, some people will say the other one, I will say why would entrepreneurs, are you saying entrepreneurs are idiots? They won't play either or not. <laughs> exactly. So, then I would say actually if, uh, some people will try to make a case about it and I will say that is fine, then I will say actually neither of those and then I bring my third box. What do you think is in the third box?
you have to teach that. So what, what do you want to put in the third chocolate? I mean, sorry, in the third box. It's empty. You put the Pardon? It's empty and you decide what no, there's stuff in it. It's not transparent. Pardon? Mix chocolates? Make, make your own chocolate. Make your own chocolate. That is too obvious. This is one of the things you have to think about in teaching techniques. What would make the distribution unknowable? That is really the question. So, what I actually have in the third box is all kinds of stuff. Mostly stuff that I have stolen from hotels because you need small things like soap and comb. I will have safety pins, I will have little toys. Sometimes I will even have like half eaten uh, apple. <laughs> you have to have some creepy stuff too, right? Uh, uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, uh, anything that will fit into that box, like chachkis of all kinds, right? Uh, um, so, uh, my earring, you know, half a earring, sometimes if I have a broken earring, anything will be there. So, every time somebody puts in, they are getting something now. But here, when you do the exercise, one of the clever things I will do is, I am still asking, dark chocolate or white chocolate? <laughs> I am asking the same question throughout the thing. So, the first person puts in, they get a comb and then I come there and she gets a soap maybe. And then, some, this time, I do not ask them to put it back. They are so surprised that they keep it in there. I keep doing this very quickly. So, a lot of people will have a lot of little objects in their hands. Then I ask them, what is this game about and how do you play it? And they will actually derive some of the effectuation principles. So, they will say, oh, she has a comb and I have a soap. We could start a uh, beauty parlor, <laughs> right? And or somebody will say like, oh, I, ha I have this cool toy. It's a little Porsche. Uh, I usually always have like a expensive car toy, right? Oh, I got a Porsche uh, uh, and then I can trade this. Like who will give me what? So they, so you'll see very quickly that they realize that they're working with things within their hands, but you have to have other people, and then you can build a venture. So, so this is one of the exercises I do in the very beginning of the course, and then I'll tell people that every other course you have taken in management teaches you how to play these two games. <coughs> they're very good at it, but entrepreneurship is about this third game. So, throughout the course, whenever you have, I am always going to say, ah, you are falling into the chocolate game, <laughs> right? It is very useful to do that. So, that is one exercise, introducing an uncertain future that is not predictable. So, now it is a small box. So, maybe at least you can guess something, but remember, if you think about the future. Everything that is, that can come to be, can come good and bad, right? So, it is a model of the, of a truly unpredictable future where prediction just does not work. So, now you have to learn techniques and say how can it and you already know even with this little game that when you cannot predict the future, what do you have to do? You have to collaborate, right? You have to just work with what you already have because you do not know what will come next. When you put your hand in, good thing may come bad things, you do not want to put, you have a few things you are happy with that and you say I am going to work with that. But then, when you start putting it together with other people, all kinds of surprising things can happen. And then people will get the idea, how do I make, so I will say, well, you have this thing in your hand. For example, there might be like crumpled up napkin, how do you make that thing valuable? And people will think about, it. how can you make, now that guy got a Porsche and everybody wants, now nobody wants your used napkin. How do you make that thing that somebody wants? You can have that question. Can you tell me? How can you make that napkin, for example? Something that people want. Can you autograph it by you? Absolutely. So, you can just simply people will, uh, you can see very quickly, people actually think about how to make it. And that is all it takes. And I will go up, you know, just it is okay and actually sign it. Now, who wants to bid the Porsche for it, <laughs> right? Not that I am very important, but the idea is you realize that human beings can create value into things and what human beings value is what is important. It is not whether it is a napkin versus a Porsche. So, there are lots of things you can teach just through this one little exercise and then you can connect it to entrepreneurs. And so, let me connect it to one of my favorite entrepreneurs. I am going to pass through all this, you do not need all this, this is Airbnb. This is one of my favorite. 
<coughs> the co-founded by four people, two of whom are my students at Darden. <coughs> it's a company that makes um, electricity from rice husk in Bihar. And the interesting is, is kind of the napkin <coughs> story. That's why this story is, is appropriate at that point in time. So if you have to go to Bihar and you have to create electricity, uh, you think about how do you do that, the resources that you have. Now, gasification technology has existed for a long time, but it's pretty expensive to put a gasification plant. So the way you uh, create electricity from rice husk is, rice husk, if you, usually people throw it away. Uh, actually, they make little mountains of it and put it near the roadside, and it emits methane, right, which is bad for the environment. And you actually take the methane and run it through the uh, power plant system and it actually generates electricity. So that's the idea. So we know that there is no big innovation technology here. But the thing is the gasification plants cost like $100,000 or more. Uh, and in Bihar, if you go for a large project like that, there are all kinds of risks including, you know, ma Naxalites kidnapping you <laughs> and the government asking for bribes and, you know, all. and then they said that people will actually steal the electricity also. So the very, it's truly a used napkin, <laughs> right? How do you create value out of it? So here's what they did. <coughs> the, if you see the top picture, that is actually the power plant. That's not a prototype. What they built was this micro grid system. So they used materials available locally in the village, taught people to actually build the uh, power plant. They maintain the power plant also. And each power plant only powers 20 houses. And the way they uh, um, get paid is, they, the only big innovation they did was they invented a meter for the electricity in such a way that you can prepay for electricity. Why most of the people actually wanted electricity primarily to charge their mobile phones. They didn't particularly want electricity for light or anything like that because kerosene lamps are still cheaper. So, <laughs> so this is more expensive than kerosene lamp. So what they do, but they want electricity to charge their mobiles so that they can make uh, extra income, they can get entertainment, uh, that kinds of thing. So even that they didn't invent the idea, the idea they already know because how do people pay for mobile phones in these areas? They prepay. They had these prepay phone cards. Uh, and uh, so they decided to use that, they invented a meter, so you can literally say the beginning of month, you know, the guy will come and ask like, kitna chahiye? and then people will say two chargers, one fan, whatever in summer. In winter you don't need the fan, so you may not want the fan. So, and they will literally get the money and then uh, a certain amount of electricity will flow through. When the money runs out, your electric gets cut off, he will come back and uh, uh, charge. So this is how they have done, 2000 villages in Bihar now get electricity from this company. It's a for-profit company. Uh, and I heard recently Reliance wants to buy them or something. Uh, but the idea here is to say you can, you can use the principles. It doesn't matter, you can, you can think about it. So the innovation is not in the technology. The innovation is in putting these principles to work in a different kind of setting. <coughs> okay? So there are hundreds of uh, things like that that can come uh, from the, so I don't want to spend time all in the thing. I'll uh, first of all, do you have any questions on this exercise? Then I'll go to a couple more of these things that we have created to show you. So in this exercise, yeah. do you ask them to create a value, add value to whatever that they got? Yeah, yeah, but that's already happening. So it automatically happens. Or yeah, first of all, I ask now when people are left with little things in their hands, what can you do? How can you play this game? Then somebody will say like, oh, we can put these three th things together and start. Another one will say, I have a Porsche, so I can actually trade that for something. <laughs> and then I will talk about people, how can, what can you do? Whoever got stuff that they can't do anything with. And then I will ask them, how can you create value from that? Then they'll start thinking about creating value. Then you can show them one story like this. And then you again now you can say, now look at all the stuff that you have. What are other ways you can create value? So you can have a, and you can literally write down a whole set of ways that they came up with. And then if you have a reading on value creation, you can give them that also as a, as the end of the class, right? Any questions on this? This is just one exercise, but it sets you up to teach effectuation. Because at the end of this, I usually give them 
my technical note, what makes entrepreneurs entrepreneurial, which is a short introduction to effectuation, which teaches all the principles. Then the next day when they come, I discuss the technical note and I put them into groups and I ask them to come up with an idea that they are going to build or at least try to build a venture on. So, use the bird in hand principle and come up with a venture idea. So, the venture idea does not have to be something brilliant, it does not you do not have to go do Google search, it is something that you can do given who you are, what you know, talk to a few people. So, you can follow this by an ideation exercise, but the ideation exercise is going to be very different now. It is not about coming up with some brilliant new idea, it is about coming up with something that is doable and worth doing for some reason for your affordable loss, which then leads you to affordable loss, right. <coughs> yes. We actually did this yeah. uh, in, in 2014 when me and my partner we were figuring out what to do. Okay. Uh, we actually did this and our you know basis was that famous ikigai, uh, you, know, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what you are good at, uh, what you enjoy doing and what you will get paid for. Okay. And we did this. So, hold on one second. Yeah. Does everybody knows about ikigai? Yes. If not, you first write down, you have to send an email at least to me or to Darshan and we will make sure everybody. So, every resource that right. all of us have, let us all start sharing. Okay. So, right. so I have given you an assignment and now tell us. Yeah. 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 So, we, we did this and we looked at what we have done, you know, uh, voracious readers, we like to quiz, yeah. uh, we worked in, uh, you know, innovation uh, uh, groups. Yeah. Given all this, what is it that we can do? Yeah. And then we place the constraint on ourselves, okay. saying that we will not go for any external funding. Correct. Uh, that uh, cleared a lot of things. <coughs> yeah. We didn't want to do this, and also because I had uh, an experience of having raised funds for Correct. a venture of my own, so we said let's use that learning. Let's place this as a as an overlying, you know, Correct. constraint about everything that we do. That helped us, you know, look at affordable loss. And again, coming to your point, sir, yeah. uh, what has happened is over the last four years, the, the scale of our affordable loss has gone up. Of course. Uh, yeah, because, you know, like that is the starting point. But after that, it keeps moving. You know, yeah. The needle keeps moving. Correct. Uh, Especially when you start bringing other people on board, yes. because their affordable loss gets adds to you, added to yours. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just a uh, very fresh example that we have now is last uh, two months we had been talking of a particular product, I was telling you about, you, telling you about a mail uh, subscription, it is about power of reflection, mm -hmm. uh, so how can we make a habit for people to reflect upon whatever they are doing. Uh, so, we came up with a, with a product note where we said that we can actually deliver reflective questions to people over email. Uh -huh. We just put up a, a page. Uh, and we said there is an annual subscription, there is a lifetime subscription. Mm -hmm. Actually made the first three questions after we got paid for a life subscription. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, again it was a, a yeah, yeah. question of you classic know, effectuation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean bird in hand, I, I, now that uh, I see this, yeah, I mean we, we thought it was logical <laughs> to us. Now it seems like, yeah, we, you know, we were. Correct, because it comes system. from experienced entrepreneurs, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. Every time I go and give this thing for the first time to entrepreneurs, there will always be some entrepreneurs who say, oh, thank God, you know, thank God I am not crazy. <laughs> you actually have given a name. <laughs> and that's because it comes yeah. from the most experienced. And, and many of them have learned the lessons the hard way, right. like you learned, yeah, right? That yeah. funding thing does not actually work in the normal sense. In yeah. fact, when you do not have funding, it makes you more creative. You forces you to partner with people and do things like that. Um, uh, so it's a it's a great example. Any questions for him? Yeah, even I will, uh, there is another uh, observation. Uh, in addition to this, I don't know whether it has come out in your research or not. Yeah. But it, generally, people say that it takes a lot of time for startups to start making money or making profits. Yeah, correct. But I think there are a large number of uh, <coughs> entrepreneurs. Who I think from day one or maybe Correct. first month. They start making profit. Absolutely. Especially if you are going to pre-sell it. Yeah. If you are pre-selling it, uh, you have a customer already, right? That is a good chance that you are going to, at the very least, you should be able to break even. Like the ID guy, they just calculated the break even and then they made sure they had enough people who will buy that much first. <coughs> now they can do marketing, right? Because they have a break even, the machine is paid for, the workers are paid for, maybe they are not making money yet. 
but the idea really is now you can do marketing for, for much more freely because the basics are taken care of absolutely so we have we have to write these cases right we have to give these examples um, and so i like the id example on that there is a famous company from pune called it's antivirus That guy from from the beginning he never incurred loss. Quickly. Quickly. Yeah. Okay. Never incurred loss. <coughs> That's what is there. There are lots of these examples which we never hear about, right? Uh, I the, the the one of my favorites I told yesterday also. And people only talk about these people who became billionaires building Uber or Airbnb or something. But one of the most successful entrepreneurs is actually a Pakistani guy who lives in Florida, and he built just a, a slightly more useful car mat. He put these ridges in the car mat, so if your feet are wet and muddy and stuff. and you take it the water will actually fall, fall off of the that's all he is a billionaire he never has to go public nothing of that kind is his product just really sells and nobody writes the case about him or things because they just think it is an unsexy product right but the guy is not answerable to anybody he literally owns the money that comes i'm mean, like what's wrong with that <laughs> right so some of the best companies are making money from day one and a lot of them will never ever go the vc route or they never go public or anything like that but they are very very successful business they still employ a lot of people like the id people are now employing like 5000 people and all good jobs too they are not the minimum wage jobs and uh, so we need to this is one of the things you have to be doing as educators you have to figure out talk to local entrepreneurs get these details very often when we go and interview entrepreneurs or even when we bring them to class we, they just tell the high level story and then they just give gyan right so i tell my entrepreneurs when they come to class you have to actually teach so uh, even with uh, mustafa he says it's it's just common sense and i know it's not common sense right and first common sense is not that common uh so you have to tell me how did so i i've been searching the web and i found other interviews uh, where people have asked these questions much more what did you do on day 1 right what exactly did you have i asked him question were you married at the time did you have a child i mean you need to understand that because the person who is married and has a child is very different from a single person uh doing this so you have to ask these questions so i'm saying learn to ask these in depth interviews what did you day, do day one what don't just ask them the big question of how did you get where did you get the idea from i never ask that question i actually say tell me the pc mustafa story where did you grow up and then i get to the point then you can ask right why dosas why why the you know why why not dosas why batter uh and then he'll tell you what else did he consider doing that he did not do right all of the, it's not that he just got this brilliant idea you now this batter is going to uh, it's not they considered several other things they considered things like i don't want to go into something that any any mnc is doing or will ever do <laughs> right it has to be something very very truly indian and local uh where i don't have to worry about somebody coming in in fact it has to be so they actually discussed all of those things the four co-founders there i said why did you how did you choose your co-founders did you choose your co-founders first before you came up with the idea you'll be surprised in two thirds of great companies the partnership comes first and the idea comes afterwards yeah. they're not going into they are working with somebody and they say are we should go do and in some cases people have even done like i told you you don't have to leave a job but sometimes there can be two friends sometimes it's a spouse they are getting started and then one person work continues to work the other person and they know that they're going to help out if something goes wrong six months of salary or something they set aside and they say agar kuch hoga to i'll help you out right and there there are many many things like this that are going on but we don't get those stories because we are not asking questions in that detail so i always tell my uh, tell the entrepreneurs i meet gyan nahi chahiye right i am the i own the gyan and <laughs> i am a professor <laughs> i don't want gyan from you right i want data from you and let me ask the questions allow me to ask the questions because we need to teach students not how great marketing works but how do you even begin to think about marketing what is your notion of a market what do you mean same thing with funding same thing with hiring right you are asking these detailed questions so i say my specialty is 0 to 60 miles per hour and in the middle of an interview i'll stop and i ah no 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 go back <laughs> i didn't understand how that happened 
right? Where did you meet this person? Like who introduced you? I want to know every detail, right? I am like this nosy neighbor from our old village. <laughs> I want to know everything. I want to know like what underwear you are wearing, right? I will ask any question. Right? And, and interestingly, the entrepreneurs enjoy it when you tell them openly that I'm really, I'm going to like, you know, suck this stuff out of your brain and I'm going to teach my students that your gyan is not relevant to me. <laughs> right? uh, the, you don't say that first thing out of the bat, but once you ask the details, so the story of how you try to do, then you put a constraint. Uh, you know, and the constraint came from the fact that you had an experience. Now I can ask you a thousand, I can spend an hour and a half just on that topic asking him questions. And this you need only one or two people, right? Write these kinds of things and then bring that. That's way more useful than coming up and saying, oh, here's this poor guy who started, he was inspired by his, his father and, and the uh, thing of breakfast and then he went to IAMB and he did. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that doesn't help anybody, right? Because most of us are not really poor people born to a coolie in Vinod and right there we have lost the battle, right? <laughs> so you also have to talk about somebody, here's this rich guy, you know, yeah, you want every kind of story, but you want to write the story, you want to ask these questions in detail. Okay, good? Yes. <laughs> Yes. So you obviously have a lot of preconceived notions about ideas and all that. So Correct. did you come across in your uh, sample where you know you could differentiate between uh, a first generation entrepreneur from a second or third generation entrepreneur and their cognition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting question. In fact, Kumar and Suresh uh, uh, and I, we actually published a paper recently um, in uh, it's, it's about an international business, an Agarbati business in Bangalore. And uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, this is actually in Bangalore. Bangalore. Yeah, and uh, the first generation they had built the Agarbati business, and the second generation, the guy actually did an MBA from Australia somewhere, and he wanted to come back and professionalize the entire business. So now they do things like chocolate Agarbati, right? They're, so uh, and how they sold, and also how they actually exported. So, so a lot of these things they started by exporting because they knew that the kind of incense we sell won't sell in Australia or some other places. So they said well, vanilla was a big deal, right? People wanted vanilla scents in their house, candles. So they literally copied scents from candles that you could do in the incense stick, things like that. So we actually wrote that story of how he built it effectually, but also the causal, because they have an existing business and they had to protect the, like the fee, the local people were buying it because it's a religious thing things like that and then the father had conflicts you know all of those there, there are all these issues but the idea really is think about it effectually right so if your father is not allowing you to do something you have to think that becomes a constraint now you have and there are two things you can do so you can actually think about what can you risk for affordable loss given that your father is and you have to think about what would it take dad for for you so how can you make it affordable loss for the father to actually work with you, to allow you to try an experiment, right? So that crazy quilt part of it. And then once something happens, uh, then they, they get very excited and they, they're natural they, because the previous generation actually are the entrepreneurs. They build the company, then their entrepreneurial instincts. Then the father comes in and gives all kinds of ideas on how you can market these things everywhere. And also then he realizes how you can market this in India. Because now he actually talks about like the, we have to build a global brand and you know, stuff like that and the issues. But you can't, day one, they're not, people are not going to buy your ideas. So we did write one, which is sort of both family, business and international. But other people have written other, uh, lots of, family business, uh, uh, in the family business literature, there's a lot of evacuation uh, studies that have happened. <coughs> uh, any other? Okay. So, so do you have any, uh, is there a particular uh, thing that you want to go or shall I just go to the next teaching no, example? Uh, Pardon? Yeah. This evacuation are you proposing as a method or as a competencies of entrepreneurs? So I, yeah. Or is it a process? So it's all of the above, right? So I'm, I'm teaching that primarily because there is an aspect to it which is, um, which is a method, right? There's a series of strategies and techniques that you can learn. Okay. Then you put that into a process. I showed you the process diagram yesterday and I can show here also. <coughs> 
So you take the principles and the techniques and then you learn how do you do them over and over again and you connect it up. That makes it a process. And then once you have done it, then the, it becomes intuitive. So now you don't have to consciously say bird in hand or anything. You're automatically, you're always thinking effectually. So it becomes a competence. It becomes an expertise uh, over time if you practice it large enough. And so we have even done a little bit of work on what can you practice to become better at it. And what you practice is the ask. So that's what we have been working on the last five years and yes, things like that. Yes, you have a good discussion on uh, how you could have an effectual life as Yes, yes. We had a very good discussion yesterday on that, mm -hmm. where one of the participants was saying, on my personal life and personal life decisions, how can I use this? And we had a good yeah, discussion yeah. on that. Yeah, we can do effectual life. I can also tell you there is a group uh, the Peace Appeal Foundation, they've actually developed a protocol for negotiating peace, an effectual uh, method of negotiating peace. There's all kinds of, uh, uh, but you can easily imagine, right, that you can use these principles in other things, things other than starting a venture. That's not difficult for us to imagine, I don't think. As I always joke, the uh, undergraduates, they just want to know effectual dating. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> How do I ask a girl out? Usually it's the guys who want to ask. And sometimes the girls want to know how do I say no effectually. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that you can discuss. So one of the things I'd like to do is I'd like to walk you through the process diagram yeah. and then also tell you one or two more examples of exercises. And then some of it, uh, a lot of the exercises is actually on effectuation.org that I'll ask you to check it out as well. So let me, uh, so I'm going to fast forward the, because yesterday we did it for practitioners. I've got lots and lots and lots of stories. And uh, so here is the, uh, the process model. So the first is the set of techniques, right, the principles. Uh, uh, and then now you're going to put it dynamically. That is, what is a process? Process is nothing but something that happens over time, that you do it over. So you start with who you are, what you know, and whom you know. You ask yourself, what can I do for affordable loss? And I always say, that this is just day one. Right? Day two, what do you do? You start talking to people interacting with people. And when you start talking to people, what are you trying to do? I already mentioned to you, it's not only about advice and information. Advice and information is the minimum you should get. What you're really trying to do is you're trying to get people to commit something that you're trying to bring them on board to build the venture. I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to give you the whole diagram. I'm going to give you another exercise and then I'll tell you. Yes. Yeah, a major constraint here in this step is people don't want to share their ideas. Correct. Yeah. So how do you overcome that? <coughs> okay. So I have a two-pager on this that I will share with you, but I'll walk you through that right now. So I tell uh, students, okay, you have come up with an idea. It's a great idea. I don't want to go talk to somebody because somebody will steal it. So I tell them, uh, first of all, when you go talk to people, most people are going to think it's a bad idea. <laughs> right? Your problem is not going to be that they're stealing. They're going to say, are beta. You can do, why are you doing this, <laughs> right, <laughs> if they care about you. If they don't care about you, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, I will never ever buy this product. So they might say harshly, they may say nicely, but most of the time, they're not going to think it's a great idea. Let me tell you, Airbnb, everybody thought it was the stupidest idea on earth. Uh, and so, so that's the first thing you have to know. Uh, second thing, let's say you do have, you know, a really good idea. There are two kinds of people you can be worried about. Right? One is somebody who is in that industry, now she's built a company in that industry, she has competence. Now you are coming up with a product that might put her out of business, but definitely she's kind of, you know, in that industry, she knows everything about that industry, even if it is not direct competition, she can do this like this. Because they have the knowledge, they have the networks, they have the money, there's an established company. Uh, and this is the one people get most nervous about. And I'm always sending students to talk to that company first, right? Uh, and uh, so the first thing you will notice is, let's say you are a novice entrepreneur and you're coming in and uh, talking to her. And, uh, the, uh, and let's assume she actually thinks it's a great idea, right? Now, if she's a good business person and doing very well, chances are she doesn't have people <laughs> sitting around doing nothing. Uh, who can now suddenly build this product, a new product line. So what is the best thing she can do if she has any brains? Pardon? Collaborate. But here's what, she can do something better than that. 
This is, and this actually happens. Exactly. We give them a job offer. Right? This happens to my students all the time. This is the other way I cut across this thing of job versus entrepreneurship. I said, would you rather do a job for McKinsey or you actually get to whatever, you know, you have this uh, whatever organic, uh, uh, or, you know, milk-free gelato, <laughs> whatever your idea is, right? Would you rather not go to Whole Foods and they hire you and pay you a nice salary uh, and bonus and you actually get to build the gelato, right? Uh, and you will get that opportunity if you go and talk to them now. Instead of seeing them as competition, we're going to steal their idea, steal your idea. Uh, so that's what happens. They will give you a job offer. Then I will advise the student, take the job offer. <laughs> you are a novice entrepreneur with your first company. But make sure you negotiate equity. And make sure you tell them, my dream is actually to do my own thing. So A, take a pay cut, that's what I will say. So let's say they offer you $100,000 a year. I will actually tell them, say I want only 60, 40 I want in equity. And that's good for them too. And I want the option that if it grows, that I can earn more options, so I can own this part of the business. And eventually, maybe we can spin it off or something. We can have all the, you don't have to have all the conversations. All you need to do in the early stages is negotiate some equity. Then what happens is it's also easier for them to hire you, but you are not just a regular employee. And then down the road, you get all kinds of entrepreneurial opportunities open for you. And you get that. So this is what happens most of the time. Nobody just, just steals the idea. The second thing is maybe you talk to somebody else who's just like you. He is also starting a company, slightly different product, but it's very similar to yours. You go talk to him and now he can get all kinds of good ideas because your features are better than his. This one I'll say first, it's going to happen anyway, <laughs> right? The moment you build a venture, if you have a product, somebody is going to imitate you. Competition is going to happen. Right? That's the first thing you have to do. So you have to compete actually on executing better, getting the sales, that's part of it. Plus, you can still collude with him. You can actually tell him, I have a feature that's actually, if, we, if the two of us worked it together, right? we could actually do better, first of all. Plus, <coughs> we can even keep both of it. You can try your thing, I can try my thing. But we know we are going to collude because maybe yours will take off first. And mine will lag, or mine will take off. Then whoever comes, the other person becomes co-founder and comes along. You can make all kinds of deals with the competitor. If you go in with the mentality that you're going to offer them deals, not just treat them as competitors, because they are going to compete with you anyway, right? When, when you're facing the unknown and you don't know which product is actually going to do well, you actually have an opportunity to collaborate. Once his product starts doing well, it becomes much more difficult in some ways to collaborate with him. And so this idea of the crazy quilt is very, very powerful. Uh, but you have to think through these things. So this is what I actually have written in that two page, why you should not be afraid to talk to people. And then I say the worst case scenario, let's say you go and talk to her, the experienced person who has money and who has the knowledge and everything. And she does have a couple of people. Maybe she just has a Luka son who is not doing any job. Now he's willing to do it, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, you will have many more ideas. Let it go. Rather do that because by not talking, you are going to own 100% of nothing. Because in building a venture, you have to talk. And when even if you are able to bring it to market, it starts succeeding, you are going to get him competing. It's going to happen anyway. So I'll say it's okay. Take a shot at it. Uh, and maybe you can also sue her afterwards. Right? You can have a media uh, PR thing. I went and talked to her and she's told me. There are many things you can do. But the thing is, you can. Sometimes it happens. You come up with the idea and somebody else builds it. Happens all the time. Bill Gates does that to other people all the time. So just to kind of add on that, where two competitors came together, that's the story of PayPal. Yeah. So uh, Elon Musk was working on uh, similar, they were competitors. And Elon Musk were competitors, and then they figured out that they both were bleeding money. And uh, the only way to kind of go forward was they come together, and Peter Thiel became the CEO, <coughs> as Elon was heading the product yeah. side of things. Yeah, so there are many, many examples. Uh, um, Boston, uh, Tom Stemberg, Staples, his competitor funded him. That's how he got started. Uh, and uh, so, does that answer the question? Yeah, plus I, that one I have already have a two-pager, so I can send you that. Um, okay, so before we finish the process diagram, 
I want to tell you another exercise <coughs> that I do. And the exercise that I do is the venture ideas for those of us who do ideation, right? Here is a very different uh, kind of venture ideas exercise. What we do in this one is I walk into class and I already prepare that ahead of time. I have a whole bunch of just random news stories, usually five news stories. Uh, recently, uh, so, uh, so some of the things I used, there was something about quantum, uh, you know, non-locality, like a high physics thing, uh, which nobody understands. There was also something like uh, during downturns in economy, people eat more candy, right? Just uh, you just pick random stories like this. There's a recent study from psychology that when people touch rough surfaces. Uh, and then if you ask them to donate, they are much more likely to donate more, right? <laughs> you, you pick, there are all these, you, you can find these stories, right? There are five random stories and I put them, I, I print them out in five different colors. So each story has its own color. This is for me to know which, which story is which color. I mix them all up. So I get all these colored sheets. I come into class and give it out to everybody. Okay, so everybody gets some random story. And just assign, story just one story. Everybody gets one story each. Uh, and I ask them to do two things, right? The assignment is you have to come up with an idea based on the news story that you can do, okay? So it can't be some fantasy, right? You read the news story and you have to come up with a venture idea that you can do and you have to tell me what is the first thing you are going to do on that idea and do does not count going to Google <coughs> and spending a lot of time doing research. It has to be action that you take. And then you go to the board and you just start. First, you take one story. And I usually like to start with the very abstract physics. Uh, whoever got quantum non-locality, like I, I know which color it is. So I say, okay, you, what's your idea? So I give them about five minutes to do this assignment. They have to come up with the idea and they have to come up with an action. That's that. And on the board, I'm going to put all ideas on one side, actions on one side. That's what I'm going to do. So I go to the board and I'll ask quantum non-locality, tell me what's your venture idea and the person, I don't even understand this and like I can't even think of a venture, uh, I don't know what to do. I'll say anybody with a quantum non-locality story who has an idea and somebody will say, oh I had the same problem that she had that uh, I couldn't understand it. So I thought I'll start a company that will actually teach you physics. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's not a brilliant idea or anything like that, but it is connected with the new story. So I'll, say, I'll write down the idea. Then so action, and she'll say, well, you know, maybe I'll go to the physics department and ask like some professor if they're willing to uh, uh, think, or somebody will say, that is, I know this very. I have a classmate, you know, who went to MIT, and I'll ask him if he'll build a website and he'll do like frequently asked questions. So I'll, give, so I'll write down the action. Then I'll go to the next. I just spent five minutes on quantum non-locality and then suddenly she will say, oh, now I have an idea because now she realizes that it doesn't have to be quantum non-locality per se, right? So, and some people will come up with, I don't know what this thing is, but I'm sure the Department of Defense will be interested. <laughs> and my uncle is a general and I'll try to go and talk to the, you know, the people say, I don't know my idea, but I know an action. <laughs> right? So you get all these things, you write it down. Uh, then you'll say, okay, let's take the yellow. And the yellow is like, you know, people eat more candy. And then the, all the quantum known look at, how come they got such an easy one? <laughs> so because they, it, there will be like five or six like candy uh, based, uh, I'm going to do special kind of candy, I'm going to do no sugar candy, I'm going to actually do a dental business because with all these people eating candy, like the more dentists will be required. So you'll get all these ideas and each of them will give actions. So you keep doing that with all the five stories and at the end, you'll have a whole bunch of ideas that have come up, okay? And a whole bunch of actions. And I go to the back of the room and I ask people, what do you notice? The first thing you notice is, virtually knowing nothing with random news stories, people will come, can come up with hundreds of good ideas. Some of them will be goofy, but most of them will be like, yeah, you can imagine a venture and it just seems doable. People might pay for it. So you have viable ideas on the, what do you think happens on the right hand side? This is a question for you now. Do what do you do think you'll find on the right side? Do yeah, but what is it? What do you think the actions will be about? 
Yeah. There are only two kinds of actions you will get. Build something or bring somebody on board. Some, because in some cases like candy, people will say I am very good at sweets and I can make the sweet. right? So if you take away research, people will come up with, so some of them will be about I can build a website, you know, I can build a product. So you will get some build, but almost everything is either build something or bring someone on board. So I tell them, what are you waiting about? Pick an idea. Because whatever idea you come up with, whether it's quantum locality or very high falluting technology company or pretty ordinary company, you are going to either if it is within your affordable loss and your bird in hand, you are going to actually build something, which you can do. And it is never or, and you have to bring people on board anyway. So that is why the rest of the course is all about bringing people on board. And as you bring people on board, and this is where the <coughs> process again. So you are going to go talk to people, you are trying to bring people on board, you are trying to get them to commit something. The moment you are trying to bring people on board, what happens? Here comes the next exercise. Okay, You will go out and talk to people and I like to do this with a pen. So let us say this is your idea, but this pen does not exist, it is only in your head, right? because it is something you are imagining that you can do based on your burden hand and your affordable loss. And now you are going to go try to bring people on board. So let us say you are going and talking to somebody, she is the you know, purchase manager for a very large department store that sells its stationery. Right? So like in the US you talk about staples or office depot or something like that. And you are going to talk to her <coughs> and I will say, you go and show her this and you start talking. What do you think will happen? And usually I have students actually do role play. Somebody will play the manager but somebody will play the entrepreneur. And if the thing does not go well, you can always step in and I will become the entrepreneur <laughs> if needed. Uh, or if the purchase person is not very tough, then I will play the purchase person and be very tough. But the idea really is you start thinking, how would that conversation go? So usually the students will come up with, you know, you know, I have created this pen, this is beautiful, you know, they will say some, they will make up stuff because they will never try to sell the pen that you are showing them, right? Because they do not believe that you can build a venture on this. So they will start fantasizing about it. This is the cheapest pen in the world, it's the best, or it's eco-friendly or something. They will come up with it. And they'll say, no, 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 you're going to talk about this pen. <laughs> right? They'll talk about it. And usually that person will say, Oh, we already have other pens. So the only thing they can come up with is this is a cheaper than that, or something like that. Most of the time, people are either going to say no, it won't work, right? Nobody is going to write a purchase order the first minute. They're usually going to say something like, why are you doing this pen? Right? Who uses pens these days? Right? Nobody actually uses any pens anymore. Now, if you made it eco-friendly, like people are using for, if it is biodegradable, I would be interested. Somebody else would say, you know, nobody uses pens anymore, but maybe if you put some technology in it, like a pedometer, so I know how many steps I am uh, taking. So, it, so that could be a reason. Um, put a heart monitor in. So that you will usually get ideas on this is, this stupid thing is not going to work, but if you did something, you are going to get that person's advice. Okay? So they are actually telling you if it is green, if it is heart monitor, if it is something else. I always tell students when I play the purchase manager, I will say pen is usually not the problem. I can never find paper. When I, I, nowadays nobody uses paper. So pen is still, it looks good and I can carry it. But So if you can find a pen which has paper in it. Right? So I will tell them uh, something like that and they are like everybody thinks that is a great idea right? and then they immediately start thinking about how they can make that uh, stuff like that. So you are doing uh, this exercise, the question you are really asking is what is your response to that person who is telling you do something a little bit different. What are some responses you can have? <coughs> so when you are asking people to commit something just to your idea, to your dream, right? you do not have this thing yet. And they are, they are saying something. What do you think your response can be? What are some responses you can have? So you can ask them if they would be willing to buy if we come up with that product. Okay. So you can ask them, will you buy this? Or you can ask them, can you help me build this product? Okay. That is because now you know effectuation. <laughs> with students, no, that is correct. Uh, so with students usually, the first, especially if they, you have not, even if you have assigned the eight pager, they still will, because their natural instinct is that it takes time for people to learn this thing. 
usually they will actually say persist. So this is my, this is the pen. Why would you change your idea because just somebody uh, asked this uh, this particular thing? You there are other people you can go. Maybe your sales pitch is not correct, right? So you learn how to sell uh, from that first one, and then you have to find somebody else who will actually want that. So persist is one one option. Is I'm going to persist. Maybe she is not the correct customer for me. I need to find a different customer. That can be one uh, response. The other response is adapt. Oh, customer says they want you know something that is biodegradable. Now of course I'm going to make biodegradable, and then I'll say okay, how do you make biodegradable? Because that's not your bird in hand or affordable loss. So then, then they'll remember the venture ideas exercise, and they'll say, oh, I'll find some. I know this you know uh, scientist who is doing all this biodegradable material or something. I'll go talk to them or something, and that's okay. That's also a possible response. Uh, and uh, as I told you, this is the MBA response. Oh, I'm going to talk to many different purchase managers, many different people. Uh, and then what happens is one person wants biodegradable, another person wants a heart monitor in it, a third person wants paper in it. And now which one are you going to do? And they'll say that there's some way they're going to actually do some market analysis and they'll come up with what is the best thing, the cheapest product, what most people wanted, you know, you can do. Answer to that very simply, don't do that. Uh, and then the effectual answer, which is there is some reason why she's thinking. She's an expert on pens. Uh, she's been buying pens for a long time, buyer for a large company. And you want to ask her, uh, sure, uh, how can I, if you were to build a biodegradable pen, how would you do that? Right? There are many ways you can ask this question. Uh, would you actually be willing to work with me on building that biodegradable pen? And usually, whenever somebody comes up with an idea, there is something in their bird in hand, why they are actually suggesting that particular thing. So in her case, it could be because people are, she's beginning to see more biodegradable materials uh, that are coming through. In which case, she may know the people who are actually making biodegradable stuff, right? So if she says, oh, we are seeing many, many more products that are made of biodegradable materials, you can in immediately ask her, so can you actually introduce me to some of these people who are making these things in biodegradable? Now all of a sudden, notice what happened. She's no longer a customer, you have turned her into a supplier. And maybe she knows people who has that. And then you say, <coughs> and then you want to tell her um, uh, one thing, the minimum you want to ask is, will you introduce me? What you really want to say is, can we fix up a meeting with that person? When is that person li likely to come to you again? And I'd love to meet those people. So the idea is to invite her in to become part of your supply chain, is what you're doing, right? But you can also just simply ask her, if you write me a purchase order, I will go figure it out. You can say that too. But the idea is, you are trying to think about different people and different people will give you, for example, the heart monitor. Maybe that person lost somebody to heart disease and it's just on the top of their head, mind, like we need to get people to exercise more and then we need to um, do all that. And then in that case, you might say, you know, uh, are you working with people, are you working with the heart association, with the cardiologist or so? and then maybe they put you in touch with and then there is some other thing that you can do in cardiology. So each person has their own vision of your idea and depending on what commitment they make, you can go that way. In the meanwhile, you can still go pitch this to the next guy. It's not an either or situation because if she is now going to introduce you to the suppliers, then you can do a little bit of that, you can talk to, and then maybe the person who is building biodegradable already has a mold for a pen. And then you can ask, can you get me 10,000 pens made? And then you can ask her, can you place the order? And you, it may not be your idea to make a biodegradable pen, which probably doesn't look as beautiful as a pen you're imagining. Uh, but the idea is, is, is moving along. So the way you change and move is commitment by commitment. And so this, you can see that the model uh, kind of gives you the four kinds of responses. And then I'll let just uh, kind of finish the process. So every time somebody gives you a commitment, any kind of commitment, you now have new means, right? Your, your affordable loss, your means is increasing and it becomes about who we are. So you always want to qu move as quickly as possible to the we, so that they are thinking with you. It's almost like they are building their own venture. That's what that, the conversation has to have that language 
throughout very quickly it becomes about if you were building it how would you build it and how can I help you build this this is a great idea right now you have become a stakeholder in her idea you want to do that kind of thing. So, it becomes who we are, but then your goals also change it is not your original thing that you are doing and so what you can and cannot do also changes and along the way there are still things outside of the control of all the stakeholders that can hit you in some way right. The government changes some law, there is a war, there is an earthquake, all kinds of things can happen. Uh, so, then your both your bird in hand and affordable loss can also change due to outside influences and that is why you need the lemonade principle. But this process and we have shown 5 to 8 key stakeholders and you usually end up building not just a new product or a new venture, you usually reinvent a market segment, you end up building new markets altogether. So, that is the process part of it. So, I have taken all the techniques and then you can show if you keep doing it every time there is a commitment things move forward right it, it moves forward commitment by commitment, but it takes usually 5 to 8 big commitments to come up with a new business model that, but every step of the way is already paid for. And the beauty of this is the implication for performance right. The implication for performance is not about the probability <coughs> of success, it is just that if success happens chances are very high that you are going to come up with something new because nobody in the process could actually predict what the ultimate product will turn out to be <coughs> right and they do not whether they could predict or not they do not have to be able to predict it. But if you fail the cost of failure every person loses only what they can afford to lose, so you can all like try it out again. So, those are kind of what the expert entrepreneurs learn and this is why they learn these lessons and they embrace them and they say even if I could predict the future I would rather do it this way. But once something is underwritten, once a customer has already paid for the mold and now I have the product, now I can scale it up, now I can get causal if I want, I can write a business plan, I can get an investor on board and scale it up and that is fine. So, you can mix and match causal and factual, it is not a problem. But the early stage you do not want to be the smart genius who comes up with a brilliant idea right, you do not have to be because then all you have is you have your idea you already built the pen and now it is just a yes or no answer from the world. The world is either going to buy it or they are not going to buy it and you never want to get into a yes or no, you always want to get into a thing of you know let us do this and do this you are shaping right somebody you are shaping the future and you are shaping the market, you are shaping the product ok. So, I kind of have covered uh, the basics of evacuation, but also have shown you some ways to teach it along the way uh, and in some ways I hope the way I am doing this, this also is a pedagogical technique yes yeah that is why I tried yeah. to uh, kind of get it to this point. <coughs> So, when you go to the website uh, you have many many more things for example, we have a whole bunch of things just on asking I just wanted to show that to you just on asking we have a model of asking which is also this right please would you be willing to versus here is why you should and then the quid pro quo right if you buy the you know you will get that kind of thing and then the entrepreneurs way which is what would it take for you and then let the other person actually craft the pitch for you and have examples and stories and we also have techniques I mean like a, a series of teaching materials and exercises all created about that and we can discuss a little bit more of that as well, but I do want to give them a lunch assignment before we actually go to lunch yes. Yeah, yeah sure sure yeah. Although I may not be the uh, best person I can introduce you, so you will definitely uh, I will do that um, and uh, so th in fact, it is just www.effectuation.org I should be able to show you the reason I would rather show you right now even if I do not spend 10 minutes on it just at least show you the website is because it will help you uh, through the assignment. So, let me give you the assignment and then I will show you the website, so you can explore a bit during the uh, while you are working on the assignment and then you can ask more uh, do not waste you know enormous time searching the website, but you can at least have a preliminary uh, uh, thing. So, here is the so I am going to fast forward all this. So, uh, I walked through some of the 
experience. So, here is the assignment. <coughs> I want to form, let me see, uh, we have 4, 8, 12, 16, um, maybe 20 people. Ah, okay. Okay. So, yeah, I think we have about 20 people. So, how about we make groups of 4 people and I want you during lunch to actually design a module, right. You do not have to design an entire course, but it can be a module. Uh, so, you can think about who will be taking, is it an undergraduate course, a graduate course, uh, is it something you will st start in the beginning of your course or an, and then you can design the module, right. Is it a 90 minute session? you want to design a four hour executive education session or you want to do a two day workshop kind of thing. So, you decide that together and actually come up with a class plan for that session, right. Um, so, I since there are 20 people which means we can make group uh, five groups of four people each, I will even do go one further and each group take one principle. So, you have to teach one principle as uh, part of the module, okay. So, I want you to actually try to create the class plan, uh, uh, so that then you will have other questions that will come up. So, actually working on the assignment. So, when you come back, uh, I am actually going to ask you to come up here and present your class plan, okay. So, you have to tell us, is that good? So, uh, let us think about some ways, um, we could just simply have any four people or we, I think that will, because when you have variety. Uh, some people might already have taught effectuation or some people might have, some people might be t teaching postgraduates, other people might be part of an incubator. Actually, when you have variety, you get more creative, okay. So, <coughs> can you first form the teams? So, how do you, the, the people in the back, you will form one team? I have class in the afternoon. Okay. Extra okay. Not That's fine, they can present it, right. So, the four of you, the four of you. Okay, four of you. So this is three groups. Uh, how about there? There are three people in the back. Okay, so the four of you, uh, and then the four of you. As I said, you need not come. I mean, you don't have. Even if you're not coming back, if you have a little time, you can talk to them. Yeah. Uh, just be part of. If you want. Okay. So, so we have five teams, right? So does anybody have a burning desire to take one principle? I will give you a choice, otherwise I can just assign the principles also, right. So, <coughs> unless you say you have a burning desire, I am just going to do just same way, bird in hand, affordable loss, crazy quilt, lemonade, pilot in the plane, is that good? And do not worry too much if you do not quite understand or if you end up using something else, it is fine, but try, right. And the way we are going to work is we have one hour for lunch and then you are going to get another 30 minutes. So, I would suggest sit together during lunch and start working on it and brainstorming a little bit. Uh, so, I am always like this hard uh, task master in some ways, but I also am equally hard on myself. I do not want even a minute <laughs> wasted, <laughs> that is one of my thing, uh, but that is just because I am crazy passionate about education. So, that is another issue. So, I would suggest if possible uh, hang out uh, during lunch and if you want to take a little bit of break and go make a call or say you know uh, do that amongst yourself. But we also have, we are going to extend lunch by half an hour, so that you get time. So, that does not mean that you just hang out and have lunch for one and a half hours. <laughs> so, uh, and when you come back, you are going to come here and you are literally going to present your class plan on the principle, okay. But you get to choose what kind of class and what is the course and uh, it does not have to be entrepreneurship even if you do not want it to be can be part of any, but you must have some kind of a title for the course and you have to tell me who is in the, who are the students and how long the, and then you're, the most important thing is you have to give, present your class plan. And the idea is you will get feedback from me and you will get feedback from each other. Uh, and then you will also have a lot of questions that will come along the way and write down those questions and we will discuss that in the last session, okay. And I will hopefully provide more. Our topic was supposed to be bird in hand. So, we have thought of a two day program, a two day program broken into four parts. Uh, first part is uh, who am I? So, on that uh, it is all activity based and uh, the activities, uh, the initial part is where you uh, describe yourself as to who you feel you are. 
So you describe yourself the way you perceive yourself to be. And after that is over, we conduct a professional uh, personality test. And after the personality, personality test, the results are given to each participant. And that uh, result will tell you what the test uh, feels about your personality. So who you are in terms of what you thought you are and who you are based on the personality test. The output is in front of you. So all this will be in a workshop mode, in a activity mode and therefore more time will be given to you. So the entire first half will be only on this. Post lunch, first half of the second half is to talk about the personality types as to which personalities are suitable for what kind of occupations or professions or activities and depending on the personality that you have certain activities you should definitely do certain activities you should not do there are certain personalities who cannot work individually there are certain personalities who cannot work in a team so which are the right personalities who can come together and work as a team and if these are the kind of personalities how you could understand the other person's personality so that you can work effectively. So that will be the first half of the second half. After this, after the second half break, we have the session on who I know. So I'm skipping the sequence a little bit. Sure, sure. Who I know. And who I know. And the whole thing is not sequence at all. You can start anywhere. It's not a problem. Yeah. Right. So who I know is going to be a quick uh, checklist. Again, the concept is the same. First, you tell us who you know in terms of numbers. We don't want specifics, but just tell us how many people you know. And then we have the standard exercises where you expand the number of people you know. Like for example, how many people on your phone book? How many people on your LinkedIn uh, uh, account? Mm -hmm. How many people on your Facebook account? And how many people in these three, but who stay in your society? So in many cases, the people who stay in your society are not in the yeah, yeah. list at all. Or you take a campus. On a campus, there are 1,000 people. How many of those 1,000 people are in these three? So if you really sit back and look at it, the contact list can be expandable. The other part of the contact list is not only whom you know, but through whom you know, who else can you come to know? So how to expand on the list? by going to the second level or even the third level. So there are certain people who will be happy to give you references or to introduce you to their network subject to certain conditions. So this is part of the um, second half of the second session on the first day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In the evening, an assignment is given. It's a take home um, exercise where you form groups of two. In that group of two, <clears throat> a situation will be given of course, we have not been able to detail it out. But the objective is, second day, first half, we will accomplish mela kind of a thing. Okay. And in that mela, each group has to perform certain tasks and activities. And in these tasks and activities, all the functions that are required for any uh, corporate life or any entrepreneurial journey will be captured. Okay. So that exercise will be for roughly three hours, where it's basically a mela. And people have to go around doing all kinds of things, you know, there will be scores and there will be measurements and there will be money and there will be resources, utilization, returns and everything. So all this will be part of the first half, second day. Second half, second day. Yeah. First half is assessment and feedback of the activity that was done. Okay. And in that, the main objective is to find out or to understand for yourself what you thought about yourself in terms of who you are and based on you, who you are, what you thought you could do. But when you actually went out to do it in that mela, you realize that what you thought that you could do, are we actually able to do or not? So it's easy to talk. How easy is it to execute and implement? So that part will be captured through an experiential learning, uh, which is in the first half and discussion or reinforcement in the first half discussion of okay. the second half of the second day. Again, after the tea break, <coughs> the last session is the winding up session where 
we give a complete overview of what bird in hand means and how you can use it to your advantage and how there are certain uh, gaps that were identified in this exercise by yourself and what are the avenues available to you to uh, work selectively on what you feel you should work on. Okay. So that's the two-day program. The title of it we have not thought of right now. Okay. But uh, you know, we Got leave it. it open to the audience to mm. suggest a title to this. Okay. In terms of the participant audience, it can be suitable for all. Okay. So depending on the composition, it can be made more intense or it could be diluted a bit. Okay. All right. Great job. Thank you. No, no, you don't get to sit down yet. Oh. <laughs> Any questions for him? We are not advising. Or you are telling them this is your personality. Correct. And it's not only personality which talks about who am I, but also talks about my own expertise, my own knowledge which I no, have, no, 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 I'm no. Only personality. But no, no, this is what they have designed. This is what they have designed. But if you can incorporate some strengths, maybe SWOT analysis. That will come in the winding up session of the second year. The no, final but winding but up in session. This particular exercise, if you can also do SWOT, where you talk about your own strengths and weaknesses, so that that is covered in the first half of the first day, second half. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> I mean, the overall theme is to discover yourself. Yeah, but in that, again, I sort of agree with, I mean, I thought that's where she was heading, that maybe in effectuation we are getting away from that personality uh, thing where anybody can be an entrepreneur. So uh, let me, let me sense, just put uh, it uh, in I a mean, little more of detail. Huh. Uh, the two summary sessions on the first day and the second day, there are two summary sessions. One is first half of the second half they on the first day, <laughs> where you discuss the personality and where you say that you know this is the personality suited uh, for certain activities and this function, that function, and all that is on the first half, second, first day, second half, first half. Okay? And the last winding up session, the post tea on the second day. These two sessions will reinforce and help you discover yourself and give you specific guidance and direction as to who you are and what you are good at, what you should do, what you can work on. Very, very specific, very, very focused. So let me, let me pick up on this. It's an important theme. So, uh, so the <clears throat> first point is to actually think, you know, is personality a cage? So, for example, there were two things that you said that I was immediately like I wanted to argue, right? The first thing is you say, you think you are this, but you are actually something else, right? So, that is one thing. But more importantly, it assumes your personality cannot change, right? And we know in psychology, in fact, the latest research in psychology is all about neuroplasticity. Everybody can change. So you have to have at the very least something in there about what do you want to be also. Not who you are, you discover yourself as though you are this fixed thing. It's something I want you to rethink. Okay? Uh, so that's one thing. But the other thing that troubled me even more was this is something we do as educators all the time. We want to teach people what they are not good at. Right? So, for example, you are saying, are you able to do what you think you can or not? And we think that if they learn, they cannot do something, that is a good thing. That is a very bad thing. So, especially as far as entrepreneurship is concerned, you actually want to challenge them. They think they cannot do it and you have to challenge them to see they can actually do more than they think they can. 
So, I would say your objective for both those do, uh, days irrespective of whether you use personality tests or how you use should be about the idea that you can co-create yourself as well, right. For example, you have a great uh, idea about the Mela. So, one of the objectives of the Mela could be what did you think you could do yesterday? In fact, make that part of the night assignment and then I would say next day sit down and write all the things that you thought you could not do. What did you learn today that you could do? So, I would change that assignment uh, for fully sure. Accepted, yeah. Fully accepted. Yeah. Now, because of the uh, shortage of time in preparation, of course. Delivery, maybe I did not communicate correctly. Oh, no, no. The, the, no need to the go. Intention, uh, no, no, no. no. Actually, the intention was not to pull down people. Yeah. The intention was to make them discover for themselves. And these two uh, winding up sessions that are there on the two days, yeah. there we are going to reinforce the fact. Yeah. That, uh, one of the things I did mention was that yes, this is your strong personality and this is your weakness. So, in case you want to enter into a particular activity, yeah. is it advisable or is it recommended that you go it alone or is it recommended yeah. that you… So, that was the other alone? thing I wanted to say that it cannot be only about you at all, right. The If you are teaching effectuation as I say, day one you can be an individual, day two you have co-creators. So, so you are absolutely right. So, the Mela is an opportunity to show them who they can work with and uh, how they can work and all that, right. Yeah. So, you want to get away from the singular you very quickly. Yes, huh? First, first half of first day is enough, I think. <laughs> uh, so, that would be my, but I think people are objecting just to the idea that uh, personality matters in the, in the sense in which people think no, it matters. can be changed provided yeah. I recognize yeah. that fact yeah, that yeah, I yeah. need to change. Correct. Or I need to be better at something. Yeah. But this is an eye opener. Yeah. Sure. To take you in that direction. Okay. Any other last thoughts or comments anybody has? So long as the objective is for them to discover things about themselves as they are today, but also give them an opportunity to explore what they want to be. Uh, individually, but also the idea that you can be through other people and with other people, you can actually. So, one way to work on our uh, weaknesses is for us to say, oh, for example, I am disorganized, so I should get more disciplined, I should get organized. Another thing is to say, I am disorganized, so I need a partner who is organized. And then what we really need is we have to figure out how you are going to get me to organize a little bit better, but I am going to make you a little bit more creative. And how can we together, imp so personality itself as something that you can co-create would be, this is an opportunity to do that as well. Nothing wrong with the design per se. I am just saying think about the objectives in more stronger positive terms and entrepreneurs will tell you this. So, you say you can you can do the SWOT analysis for example, you find out my strengths, my weakness and then what are you going to do? So, <coughs> Yeah, but I also say another way to overcome, I teach students this, I tell them there is a little joke that we have, right, uh, we used to, as a kid we used to play this little game, we will draw this line and we will say, uh, <coughs> how can you, so no, no, we will draw this line and say, uh, how can you make this line shorter without touching it? Yeah, so you draw a bigger line, right. So, I actually say, consider this your weakness. So, you can think about the weakness and try to fix it and extend it, but there is another way to do it. This is your strength. So, just keep on working on your strength and you extend that, right. It gets longer and longer. First of all, it is a lot more fun to work on your strength than to work on your. So, do not try to fix the weakness that you find a complementary partner and the strength you keep working on. So, if you keep working on the strength very often people are willing to put up with your weakness. Oh, she is always late. But then when she comes, oh man, she delivers, right. Uh, and so, the idea is the idea is to keep on focusing on the positive, increasing the positive, making the thing and then the awareness of weakness is still important, I completely agree with you. But the idea really is how you work on it, it does not have to be that you have to fix yourself. That is what I am trying to say. You have to give them, you can fix yourself also, but the idea is you can work on your weakness yourself, you can partner with people. So, you get complementary skills or you can work on your strength to such an extent like go after your strength that you become so good at what you do that the weakness becomes smaller in some ways. So, all of these things we should teach 
as per so long as and you have plenty of time as you said you are trying to explain in three minutes what will happen over two days so uh, there are a lot of things uh, that you miss so uh, so just wanted to share that with you and so long as you have that objective I think the basic design is pretty good do you have to make it about a venture or an idea yes and no you can think about that you can easily incorporate a venture on the first day's assignment and then the mela becomes about the venture, but you do not have to, it can be a leadership exercise, it can be all kinds of, it can be creativity exercise and it, or it can be purely uh, like the discover yourself which you said too, absolutely. Did you have a point? Well, a quick question to you, do you recommend using psychometrics for who am I? I usually do not, uh, I am a big, so now here my bias is going to come, uh, I think that entire psychometric literature is kind of suspicion, uh, suspicious for the simple reason that once people believe certain things about themselves, so when they fill out a survey or the, when they already have beliefs. For example, when we were in college, we all did our zodiac signs and I and have done this as an experiment because I always like an experiment. So, I am a Taurus right and people will say like a Taurus is supposed to be very earthy and strong minded and stubborn and like a bull right. And for a long time I began to believe that I am that and then what happens is then you have this self-fulfilling prophecy, you become that and it has nothing to do with like some zodiac sign and then one day you realize like that's just really nonsense and I have become this person. But a lot of people do not realize that, they have bought into it so much that when they are filling out the psychometric forms they will actually, they believe this about themselves right. Uh, and the psychometrics actually does not really show you who re you really are in many ways, right? Because that also depends on people answering those questions, they are not observing things that people have actually done. So, the kind of psychology and psychometrics that I like is the kind of things that Martin Seligman does, where he is saying, tell me how you explain what happened to you. So, and some people will say, like I said, I am disorganized, and he will say, now change that and look at the data, what are all the things that you do on this, I'm write down a diary and then come back and see. In, in many, many cases you are not, not anything, it is just that in the last 10 days over these things you have behaved like this. Once you change your explanatory style, instead of making it about personality, you make it about actions and events, all of a sudden you can become a different person. So, he has shown just by changing people's explanatory styles, you can actually change and he does before and after personality test and the personality completely changes, right. So, I am I'm a little suspicious of the personality test as a psychologist given some of these studies and also the fact that we have neuroplasticity, you really can become somebody different. Uh, at, at the same time, I am also worried sometimes people spend all their lives like I call the Siddhartha syndrome, right? They are trying to find themselves and I am like there is nothing there to find, right? It is a, it's a bunch of neurons that are getting reconnected and connected depending on experience and maybe you know a lot about how the brain works and this idea that you are going to find yourself. Instead of that I always say pick something and say I am going to do this and then you will find all kinds of things changing and your brain also changes. So, I so I will give you all my biases openly, but that does not mean that personality tells are all bad and it is not the question at all, because sometimes people are powerfully moved by their belief that they are this person and I do not want to take it away from them, because a belief can, so you know the placebo effect right, uh, even without medicine um, uh, if you give sugar pills, uh, so that it does not mean that people are stupid or anything that actually kick starts your immune system. So, why not use the placebo effect? So, I will tread carefully on dismissing it as well. All I want is whatever method you use, whether you use psychometric tests or not, keep in mind what we are trying to teach them is that they can do more than they think they can, whether individually or with others, uh, including if they really, really want to change themselves, they can do that too. So long as that is the overall objective and we keep very careful throughout how we talk, talk about it, the examples we bring, I do not mind using personality tests. That is a long answer, but I think it is important to give the long answer here, okay. Thank you. Thank you.